That's it. That's better. Oh, good morning. Morning, Tony. Great. Great to see everybody's awake this morning. Uh, I had a picture for somebody during the worship, so I'm just going to share that before we get into the scripture. Um, did you have ever seen those TV shows that are kind of like a little bit medieval? So like you've got like medieval villages and stuff like that, kind of like King Arthur-ish. Is that, is that an acceptable English grammar, King yeah. Arthur-ish? Yeah. Right, okay. Um, so I believe this, this could be for a number of people, but maybe it's specifically for one person as well. And it was like you, you, were, you were in this kind of like village, but it was like it was dead. There was nobody there. You know, and there was old, old shacks and houses and stuff, and there had been a, a lively community there at some point. And you're kind of looking around, and it's like, well, where's the life? You know, there's, there's no life in this place. And God's word to you this morning is that was once a place of blessing, but it's time to come out. You can, you can lose what God's got next for you if you stay in the same place all the time. You may have had something wonderful happen in that place, but it's time to move on. It's time to come out of that because there is a better village for you yes, to move amen. into. So I really believe this morning, that if somebody specifically, don't keep trying to live in the place of blessing that you were before. Because wasn't it Elijah that he, he got out when he wasn't being fed anymore? And he went to another place, and that's where God fed him. That's right. So, you know, if, that, if that's, I'm sure that's a spiritual context for some of you, that, that you're living in a place where it's been great in the past, and now there's no life there. It's because God wants to move you on into that next phase. And you've got to move with him, otherwise this deadness will continue around you. It once was alive, now it's dead, now it's time for something new. Amen. So I believe that's a specific word for somebody this morning. Amen? Wonderful. Amen. Can't say amen, say oh me. Right, turn with me please to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. I was thrilled when Will said to me, I'd like you to speak on Ephesians chapter 2. I went, oh yes, I love Ephesians. Ephesians is, is, is wonderful. Yeah, great book. Fantastic epistle of Paul. Love Ephesians. Right, when you're there, say I'm there. I'm there. If you're all there, say I'm all there. But which side do I want this? I don't know what side I want this side. Of right, okay. I think I'll go that side. Yeah, I'll go that side. Right, okay. So Ephesians chapter 2. We're just going to read from verses uh, 1 to, uh, to 10. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, where in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Among whom also we had our conversation in times past in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, somebody say, but God. Hey, but God. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love. Whoa. Chris, that was an awesome word. Uh, wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace ye are saved, and hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness towards us through Christ Jesus. For by grace, say by grace, by grace. for by grace are ye saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of, work, yes. uh, gift of God, not by works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. I'm going to try and go through this verse by verse and see how many verses we can get through. But I'm, I'm heading for a particular place in our faith this morning with this. So, you know, if it, if it gets a bit lengthy, I'm going to cut it short and hopefully stop where the Holy Spirit tells me to stop. But we're going to try and work through this this morning. Have a look at verse 1. And you. Well, we'll stop there. And you. So turn to your neighbour and say, he means you. He means you. And you. And you. Thank you. <laughs> I'll receive that. Right. And you. Well, if we were going to do a really in-depth study about the and you, we'd have to look all the way through the first chapter as well. The first chapter, who likes Ephesians 1? I love oh, Ephesians yeah. 1. Yeah. Glory to God. Ephesians 1 is awesome. It's packed full of power and glory and wonder and all this amazing stuff that Jesus has done for us. 
So he's talking about that. He says, and you. So he's turned his attention in the last few verses, talking about how Jesus has been raised from the dead, that great power that's available, not only for him, but also for us. Because Paul is he's praying there that we get a revelation of who we are in Jesus. If the church needs anything today, it doesn't need another Pentecost. It needs to understand who it is in Jesus. Because when we understand who we are in Jesus, Pentecost happens automatically. It just happens because of who you are in Christ. And you. And you. So it's talking to you. It's talking to me. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. Do you qualify? Were you once in trespasses and sins? Say amen if you were. And you, do you qualify? I, I, love this, I love this phrase here. It says, and you who were dead in trespasses and sins. That word dead is the word necros, which means to be separated from the enlivening influence of divine light. Cut off from God, in other words. Now, if you've been around church long enough, hopefully you will understand that that's what true spiritual death is. It's to be cut off from God. That's why in, in the world context, people don't understand us when we talk about spiritual death because the only life they have is body and soul. That's it. There is no connection. That's why religion doesn't work because religion is of the soul and spirituality is by connecting with Jesus. Right. Yes. Necros, the enlivening influence of divine light, to be cut off from it. Now, how many of you know that we're spirit, soul and body? Yep. Yes. We are spirit, soul and body. That's the way Jesus has made us to be. That's the way God created us to be. But in the world, people are cut off from that divine life. And therefore, sometimes trying to get somebody to understand spiritual truth is like knocking your head against a brick wall, isn't it? And isn't that why we pray for the Holy Spirit to come on them as we share with them so as they get enlightened to what is the truth of the word of God? Because they don't get it any other way. And we can... We can we can look at some of the nasty stuff that's going on, some terrible, terrible decisions being made all around the world at the moment. I mean, Will, you put something on about, from the Christian Institute this morning. Well, look, look at the video Will put on there. Terrible, terrible decisions being made. One person who's head of the British Pregnancy Advisory Service is selling, saying we should treat abortion as if it was another form of contraception. Yep. Well. That is sick. Yes, that is sick. But you know what? That woman's not enlightened by the power of the Holy Ghost. Right. She wouldn't say it if she was. So we're talking to dead people. We are spirit, soul and body. And if we're cut off from God, then we're amongst the trespasses and sins bunch, aren't we? We're amongst those who were dead in their trespasses and sins. Dead also means unresponsive to stimuli, no reaction to spiritual truth or no reaction to spiritual influence. It means we're incapable of any ability to understand or co cooperate with spiritual truth. So it's not religion. We're talking about life. That's why religion can never save you. That's why church going can never save you. Somebody put a criticism uh, around on Facebook, uh, I think it was this morning, that criticising a certain person said, oh, but uh, actually it was the Prime Minister. Not that she put the comment on. But somebody put, oh, but she is the daughter of a vicar. Yeah, well, you know, you can be a vicar, but being a vicar has the same influence as going to KFC and thinking you're a chicken. It just ain't be it just isn't being, is it? There's lots of people out there that are vicars and ministers, but if, if, you, if you question them about the word of God, they wouldn't know where to start, actually. They theologically get it, you know. The theology's there. But theology doesn't bring life. Right. It's revelation that brings life. Yeah. There's a lot of people that know this book, but they don't really know it because they take it out of context for a start off. But do they know the truth of the word of God as seen in Jesus? Jesus was the demonstration, was he not, of the word of God? So for all those people that think it's okay to kill old people at their end of their life and to kill young people before they're born, I'm afraid that's not life. Right. Getting political, aren't I? No, getting spiritual here. This is truth. The world is in a mess. Society is in a mess. It's going to get darker, but praise God, the church is going to get brighter. Hallelujah. Because yes, the contrast between the truth of the church and the contrast of the, the lie package in the world, it, it's just going to outshine that. That's what spiritual death does. You who were dead in trespasses and sins. 
For those of you who like the Greek, I'm going to give you a bit of Greek here so as we can get the difference between what a trespass is and a sin was. How many of us thought trespasses and sins were the same? They're not. Trespasses and sins are com- two completely different things. Trespasses, the word is paratoma. And paratoma means the unintentional fault and guilt, often through ignorance. Trespasses. Sins is deliberate. Trespasses are undeliberate. So he's saying here, you can be dead in ignorance to the word of God. You can be dead in ignorance towards Jesus. You can be dead in ignorance because you just don't know. I don't think, I don't think the UK actually knows about Jesus, do you? No. Less and less. Mm-hmm. I don't think they know. They think they know. They think they know about church, but they don't know about Jesus. I've always said, you know, even since I was a teenager, that if everybody really knew about Jesus, nobody would be unsaved. Right. What a package. What a package we get when we come to Jesus. Saved, healed, delivered, prospered, blessed, heaven. Yep. Wow. Amen. <laughs> what a package. So trespasses is unintentional, and sins is the word hamasha, and it actually means missing the true scope of our life, which is relationship and sonship with God. Hallelujah. Dead in faults and connection to God. Now, I'm going to um, try and compress verses 2 and 3 because Paul starts waffling a little bit. He's making a point, but he's waffling a bit, so he's stretching it a bit. But he says in verse 2, he says, Wherein in times past you walked, past tense, you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now works in the children of disobedience. You walked according to the course of this world, following popular direction. Sin is popular right now. Yes, it is. Hello? Sin is popular. Walking, you know, it's, it's sorry, and I know there's one or two of you, there's Martin and Will and, and maybe Simon too have said this, I hate political correctness. It's a lie from the pit. Mm-hmm. Political correctness is a lie from the pit of hell. Now, I'm not saying we all go out and start being rude to people of different races, religions, and what have you, but political correctness is actually shut up if you've got a valid opinion. Yes. Mm-hmm. They want you to think like them. Yes. Isn't it wonderful? It's, it's, it's amazing to me that, oh, yes, but we should all be different. But don't be that different, because if you jump out of the box and you start disagreeing with them, now you're the one that's wrong. Yeah. Yes. Political correctness is a sin from the pit of hell. It really is. It's an excuse to silence anybody that believes in Jesus. But we're not going to shut up, are we? No. Nope. I said, are we going to shut up? No, we're not. Or are we going to still keep speaking the truth? We're going to speak the truth. I love what Andrew Womack said on one occasion. You know, and Andrew, uh, I think he came to open um, the, uh, the, the service centre for God TV in Plymouth. And BBC turned up. Hey, good old BBC. Supposed to be Christian. Nothing Christian about them. If you read the plaque when you go in there, you'd think they were. And they turned up and they said, oh, you're that preacher, aren't you, that, that, that's, that, you know, that hates homosexuals. He said, excuse me? He says, I've got homosexual people working in my offices. Oh, well, aren't you as a Christian supposed to tolerate these things? He said, no. That threw him for a start off. He said, there's nowhere in scripture does Jesus teach tolerance. He teaches love. And love tells the truth. Mm-hmm. Love tells the truth. See, they're dead in trespasses and sins. They walked according to the course of this world, following popular direction. According to the prince of the power of the air. That's who's behind it, isn't it? That's who's behind it. We have a world of damaged people. And instead of getting that damaged fixed... They display that damage to one another and say, this is normal. So true. This is normal. But it's damaged people. Anne's always saying to me, but they're damaged. They need healing. They need Jesus. They're damaged. Damaged people damage other people. According to the prince of the power of the air, that word power, as most of you will know, that in, in, in Greek the, there are many, many words for the word that we only have you know, the word power for. The one here is authority. According to the authority of the air, the prince of the air. And that's talking about the enemy is behind all this. The enemy is behind the political correctness. The enemy is behind the people that tell you, oh, shut up, you're not supposed to have an opinion unless you agree with me. Hello? I thought this was a free country. Mm -hmm. Thought we were allowed to have opinion. Apparently not. 
apparently not. Somebody doesn't want us to have their opinion. Where's this going? Don't worry about it. I need to get through the, the, what seems like the negative stuff in order to get you into the positive stuff, okay? Huh. Power, authority, describing coming under the spiritual bullying of a renegade force. Spiritual bullying. Has anybody ever been spiritually bullied? Let me tell you what it sounds like. It's that voice in your head that goes, well, you do realise you're never going to get healed, don't you? Mm. Hello? Spiritual bullying is, you'll not make it, will you? And do you know what? It's, it feels real when it happens. Anybody had that happen? That I had a moment a few weeks ago. I've never done this quite in this way before. But I kind of like, there was this nagging going on. This worry. Nag, 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 nag. Just out of my mouth, I just went like this. Oh, why don't you shut up? What's it got to do with you anyway? That's between me and God. And at that instant, I realised I was listening to the enemy. And the voice stopped. And the deep, I had a really heavy worry on me. And the minute I said, oh, why don't you shut up? It stopped and the heaviness lifted and I wasn't depressed anymore. Amen. How many times are we hearing that, guys? And we don't recognise it. If you're hearing anything in your head that's telling you we aren't going to make it, you're not going to get your healing. It's already been purchased anyway. That's right. Jesus. You're not going to get through. Oh, who do you think you are? Anything like that. Make up your own categories. How does the enemy attack you? <laughs> Recognise it. It is not God. It is not you. You are a spiritual... If you're born again, you are a spiritual being and you can hear in the spirit realm. You can hear these things. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice and they know me. Amen. But there's also some sort of chitter-chatter goes on in the background and we've got to know this book to know what's, what's rightfully ours so as we can recognise that chitter-chatter and shut the whole thing down. Yeah. Shut it down, folks. Don't listen to what the enemy's telling you about what you can and you can't do. Reach it. Amen. It's too many of us have lived in that containment. It's time to be free. It's time to exercise everything that God has made us because he has made us alive in Christ. And yeah. we're getting there now. Yeah. We're going this yeah. right direction. Spiritual bullying. Here we are. I've got a list of you. Sickness. Well, the attack for that is Isaiah 53 verse 5. 1 Peter 2 24, Matthew 8 17. All say by his stripes ye were healed. Poverty struck, Philippians 4.19, my God will supply all your need yes, according to his yes. riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Depressed, Luke 4.18, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. Hallelujah. Satan is a spiritual bully. The spirit that worketh in the children of disobedience worketh means to be energised. Disobedience, interesting word you'll know straight away when I say the Greek word, what the English word is, apatheia. Apathy. Apathy is a killer. It'll rob you of so much stuff. The spirit that works in the children of disobedience. Apathy. The children of apathy. Apathy will kill you. Yes, yes it, will. it will. Apathy will destroy you. Listen, guys, if you're sick in your body at this moment in time, you're reaching out to God and the word of God, don't let apathy take over. You didn't get it last time. You won't get it this time. Oh, shut up, devil. The word says I've already got it. If it takes from here to Timbuktu, I'm going to stay on that word until my healing breaks loose. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. See, Satan doesn't want you well. He can disable you if he can get you sick. He can disable more people if he can get you to go around telling people it wasn't God's will to heal you. He can disable more that way. You're going to have to be tough. You're going to have to be strong. Yes, you receive Jesus in the blink. But if you're going to stand on the word of God for healing, deliverance, whatever it is, you're going to have to get tough. You're going to have to toughen up. You're going to have to go through some fights that you wish you never got involved in. And don't we know it? Once you start getting serious about these things, he doesn't leave you alone. He tries to make you feel worse. But you're going to have to fight it. You're going to have to go there. Well, Auntie Millie died. But no, forget Auntie Millie. We are not partisan to knowing everything about each other. Only Jesus know, really knows me. Only Jesus really knows you. 
and probably knows 50% of me. Your partner probably knows 50% of you, but only Jesus really knows you. Great Auntie Millie may have died for a thousand and one reasons that she didn't want you to know. <coughs> and there are anointings too. Because some people say, oh, well, so-and-so was a good prayer warrior. Why did they die of cancer? Hello? It's a different department. Yeah? Being an intercessor is a mighty, mighty thing to do. And I know a few intercessors. My daughter is an intercessor. Aren't you, Donnie? <laughs> My daughter is an intercessor. She prays and prays and prays. And she knows how to get hold of God. People can have these fantastical anointings. But we still have to come back to the base root. What does the word of God say? God's word, as I see God's word, says to me, I am supposed to walk in his health. I'm supposed to be victorious in the pathway that he's leading me. I'm not supposed to be struggling for finances. I'm supposed to be walking in his blessing. And Abraham was told he was blessed to be a blessing. We're not blessed just to make us wealthy. If we're financially blessed, it's because we're meant to be a blessing and a source through which God can send his finances. All of this is deliverance. Hallelujah. Where did it get to? Yeah. Wrath, anger, outburst, statue of mind. That's it. No spiritual sense. This is talking about these people that, that walk in, in the, the, where is it? Walk in, the, in times past according to the course of this world. And it says that they were, uh, where is it? Verse 3. Were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. And Paul saying, and you. That was you once. Yeah, once. But aha. But hallelujah, if you've received Jesus, that ain't you anymore. Amen. That's not you anymore. Now, if you're here this morning and you haven't received Jesus, and you're religious, you've been going to church and it doesn't really make sense, it doesn't really affect your life, and you behave like a Christian on Sunday, like the devil on Monday, you need to get born again. Amen. You need to get saved. You need to receive the Holy Spirit and walk in God's ways and I tell you what once you receive the Holy Spirit and truly want the Holy Spirit then walking in his ways becomes far easier than trying to be goody goody yes Absolutely. I, bet, I bet quite a number of us could say people that, that we knew that once they were born again some things started to leave their lives instantaneously yeah. things did for me I've got some friends who, who I, don't know, I know one person who tried to give up smoking several times and this is a word of faith believer she tried to give up smoking over and over and over again. And one night she was in a meeting. The power of the Holy Spirit was really strong. And she said as somebody laid hands on her, she felt something like open from the inside of her. Went outside to light up and couldn't stand it. Hasn't touched one since. 20 odd years. <laughs> Hallelujah. Glory to God. Once you get into the, under the word of God and you, you mix that with the presence of the Holy Spirit. It is awesome what can happen. It's awesome what can happen here this morning. Whew. Some of you came in sick this morning. By the time you leave, you're going to be healed. Awesome. Hallelujah. You don't look excited. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise God, Dawn's excited. Because we're mixing the word. This is why the word's so important. That when we get behind here, that we don't waffle, that we bring the word of God to the best of our ability. And then people can take that, mix it with the presence of the Holy Spirit, and kaboom, things start to happen. It works that way. It worked that way in Genesis chapter 1, didn't it? It says the Spirit of God hovered over the waters. And I like what Jesse DePlantis says. He says he fluttered. He fluttered over the water. And then God spoke. And the Holy Spirit says, sounds good to me. He took hold of that word and created everything that there was. It's the way the Holy Spirit works now. We need both, guys. His presence, the Holy Spirit, his manifestation, and the word of God. Don't ever go off on a tangent on either. Don't ever go off and say, oh, we don't. Oh, some Christians say we don't need the word today. We've got the Holy Spirit. Ugh. Oh, you do need the word because you'll become flaky otherwise. Do you know, Anne and I once went to a church. I shall not say which one, but it was in Somerset. And it wasn't Chard because Chard was a good word church. But we went to this church once. And we was told this. Well, if we're having the meeting... And God doesn't turn up. We stop the meeting and have a cup of coffee. <laughs> Woo! Hello. If God didn't turn up, 
You better find out why. Because it ain't him. It's not his fault. I'd be very worried if God didn't turn up, wouldn't you? Yeah, I'd bring him. <laughs> yeah, amen. Bring him with you. That's Anne's favourite phrase. She says, people say that God isn't there. She says, if I'm there, of course he's there. Bring him with you. He's on the inside of you. Bursting to get out. Oh, I've got to get on to this verse 4. Because this verse 4 is awesome, right? But God! Yes. Hallelujah. All this negative stuff. And then Paul goes, but God! God has a big butt. <laughs> now, don't go naughty. Look at the chuckling going over here. We're out of repentance. Cast that devil out in Jesus' name. Right? But, but God! Because when God has the word but, it's always positive. Look, look at this. Look, look at this. Communication going across the way here. Look, look at this. Right? But God. See, when we use the word but, we always use the word but in the negative. But through scripture, it's always positive. It's, oh, this is a mess, and this is a mess, and this is a mess. But God! Oh, but the doctors told me I've got cancer. But God! Yes, amen. The bankers told me I'm, go- I'm, I'm broke, I'm bankrupt. But God! Amen. Hallelujah. But God. I was sick, but God. I was broke, but God. I was confused, but God. That's God's big but with one T. Mm-hmm. <laughs> one T. God who is rich in mercy. Woo-hoo. Rich in mercy. When I was meditating on this scripture, all I could see was extravagance. Oh, this love of God, this mercy of God, that's ex- extravagant. It was fantastic because on a, on a Friday you know, I, I work with um, a guy who's not yet born again. He's, he's an Anglican, but he's not yet born again, and he's got some strange ideas. But he said to me, he said, Oh, so you're speaking on Sunday, are you? He said, share with me what you've been talk- got- going to talk about. I said, yes, yes. And we got on talking about the mercy of God. I said, Pete, God's mercy. It's not this kind of like, well, I think, uh, well, I, I don't know. I might, I might forgive you. I might. No, God goes, yes, forgiven. Yes, take it. That's the mercy of God. The mercy of God is extravagant. It's wonderful and it's awesome and it's kind and it's loving and it's, Terrific. That's the mercy of God. People come in to go, well, I don't know whether God will receive me. You ain't met Jesus yet, have you? You ain't met Jesus if you don't know how extravagant this mercy is and how fantastic this mercy is. It's, it's not that, well, he's thinking about it. He thought about it. He thought about it 2,000 years ago at the cross of Calvary and he went, yes, you can all have my mercy. If you want it, if you come to me, you can have my mercy. Right. The mercy of God, who is rich in mercy. Listen, God is a rich guy. How many people do you know pave their streets with gold paving slabs? I mean, solid gold paving slabs. But not only is he rich in that sense, but but he's so rich in his kindness and his mercy. It's always extravagant. Have you ever noticed in Scripture, everything with God is extravagant and wild and wow. Do you forgive me? Do I forgive you? The chance. The chance for you to say, can I have your forgiveness? And God goes, yes, 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 take it. Wow. You'll have to forgive me. I'm getting excited. (laughs) I've preached myself happy. Don't get excited. I'm doing it all for you. It's all right. Okay. Right, okay. Even when we were dead, Oh, hang on, I didn't finish that. For his great love, wherewith he loved us. That's the word agape, commitment love. It's not dependent in any particular mood. Some people have got this idea, haven't they, that, that well, God will heal one one day, but he won't heal the other one. That's called capriciousness. It means his mood, he has mood swings and he changes his mind. I am the Lord, I change not. He never changes. His attitude towards every single one of us is exactly the same. All the time, 100%. With God, there is no shadow of turning. He's always at that peak point with his love and his grace and his mercy. Even when we were dead in trespasses and sins, even when we were in a mess, 
That's back to verse 1. You hath he quickened. You hath he made alive. You are buzzing with the life of God if you've received Jesus. Well, it doesn't feel like it. Well, stop going by your feelings. Go by faith. Go by what the word of God says because that's who you are. And the more we stand on that and believe that, the less we'll trust our senses, our, you know, smell, touch, taste, and all of that malarkey. The less we trust that, the more we trust the word of God, the more we'll feel alive with the power of God. Hallelujah. We have been quickened, it says. Quickened. That means to reanimate, to restore to life and consciousness. Most people's consciousnesses are darkened. But the word of God will bring light to your conscience and you'll wake up. Because that word revive means to wake up. We want a revival. (laughs) Hello. Wakey, wakey. We've just got to wake up to who we are. You who were once dead in trespasses and sins, has he made alive? Hallelujah. The power of God's within you. Oh, that's, what, that's what Ephesians 1 is talking about. Verses 19 to 22. It's all these expletives about being raised up and into the heavenlies and seated with Christ in heavenly places. We have not only been given the life of Jesus, we have not only been made sons of the most high living God, but we are seated, spiritually speaking, in heaven places, in Christ Amen. Jesus, looking down on the world, looking down on situations, looking down on the fact that we have the solution. The world doesn't have it. That's right. We have it. Yes, we do. We have it. Yes. Is any of you, when you're witnessing to somebody, especially if they mention somebody's been sick or something like that, have you watched their eyes light up when you give them hope? Mm. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yes. yes. When you don't make excuses and say, well, no. maybe it was God's will. No. Kill anybody's spirituality as quick as that. But you say to them, say, I believe God. I believe if I pray for you, God will change your situation. And you see their faces just light up because you're giving them hope. You have a hope which nobody else has. And you can change the situation by the power of God. I'm going to start drawing this close because I want us to pray. Remember Lazarus. You have thee quickened. You know, it's the same, if the best scenario out is the Lazarus story of Jesus standing outside that tomb when the body was already dead for four days. That destroyed their traditions for a start off because they had this kind of weird theory around those days that if you, know, if you came back to life in three days, it's because your soul was still hanging around the body somewhere. So Jesus deci- decided to absolutely destroy that thing, remove any support for the natural, by all means turning up a day late. And then he stands outside the tomb and he says, Lazarus, life in Jesus' name. Well, he didn't say Jesus' name because it was him. But <laughs> <laughs> so we, get, we get into these habits, don't we, saying things like, Do you know what's one of the worst habits out? Everybody's guilty of this. Watch this. Watch you all squirm. I squirm as well. It's when we pray and we keep saying just. just, just. Oh, Lord, just. Oh, Lord, just. Just, 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 just. I have to keep going. Stop saying just. Start saying, hey, according to the power that works within me. You know what I mean? We all do it. Ah, Spiritual death from sickness, from being broke, coming to life. It can't really apply to me. I've been so bad. Poor thing. Even when we were dead in sins, hath he quickened us with Christ? By grace are ye saved. You didn't deserve it, but you got it. You took hold of the gift. And if you're not born again here this morning, you can take hold of that gift of Jesus. Simple. All of this, you say, Jesus, I believe that God raised you from the dead, and I confess you as Lord. Boom, that power of God comes into you, and you are alive. Your spirit comes alive, and you will then learn by the word of God how not to depend on the way you feel, think, smell, touch, taste, and start relying on the promises of God and walk in the blessing of God. But it can't apply to me. By grace are you saved. Love that word saved. Everybody knows. I always harp on about that word saved. It's soteria. Delivered. Made whole. Healed. Set free. All of it. Every aspect of life you can think of is all contained in by grace you were saved. Praise God. The whole package. Every time you see the word saved. I'm going to challenge you. If you don't do this already. I know some of you do. Every time you see that word saved. Translated into nothing missing. Nothing broken. Nothing taken away. Made whole. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. See, it's like the lepers, isn't it, that went to Jesus and only one thanked him. Nine of them were healed. The tenth one was made whole. Yeah. Wow. 
they'd have to keep going back for another miracle. He came to Jesus and he could stand in faith and receive his own miracle from Father God. Praise God. Oh, right, I need to... Gosh, I've got five more pages to go. I've got time for that. <laughs> right, I want to... Uh, let's, let's, let's move down to this. Listen to this. 1 John 3.3. 3. Don't turn there. 1 John 3.3. 3. It says that God has lavished his love upon us. God is nuts about us. Yeah. He is nuts. He's lavished that love upon us. He's raised us up and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ. Because in verse 7 it says that he might show the exceeding riches of his grace. The hoopaballo, it means superb, superman type power. That he wants to express the exceeding riches of his grace. The gravy gets thicker by grace. He's wild about you. Listen to this. I only learned this this week. Did you, do you remember Abraham lying to Pharaoh and Abimelech about his missus? Yes. Do you remember that? Who did God rebuke? You know? He didn't rebuke Abraham. He blessed him. <laughs> he rebuked Abimelech and Pharaoh for having something to do with the guy's wife. But hang on a minute. Abraham was the problem. Abraham had got faith that God loved him. And as a result, God still blessed him. Wow. Oh, when I read that this week, I went, oh! That's awesome. See, it's not to do with your sin. It's to do with who you know. Yeah. And he, the other lot got the blame for it. Abraham walked off scot-free and God prospered him. Isn't God crazy, eh? But nice. By faith. Let's finish this verse off, okay? And God hath raised us and made us sit together in heaven in places. And that in the ages to come, I did that, didn't I? For grace are you saved through faith. I haven't got enough faith, brother. It is the gift of God. And Jesus said, did he not? Didn't he say, if you have, great, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you could command the mountain to move. Here you are. Do you want to stamp on the devil this morning? Here's one for you. You haven't got enough faith to believe for that. I don't need very much. Neither do you. You don't need a lot of faith. You just need to exercise that little bit you got. And when you exercise that little bit you got, see, we're looking for mountains of faith to deal with molehills of problems. And when Jesus said, all you need is a seed of faith and it'll crack the mountain Amen. wide open. Amen. So don't allow the devil to say, oh, you haven't got enough faith. You haven't got faith like so You haven't got faith like Pastor Will. You haven't got faith like whoever your favourite preacher is. You don't need a mountain of faith. A mustard seed of faith will do everything that it needs to do. Father, thank you. Not by works, he said. You can't drum up faith. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God because that expels all your soulish thinking, expels all those feeling-based uh, ideas and puts in the will of God into your mind and that's how your faith grows. Not by works, not by trying to drum it up. Oh, if I sing 20 choruses, I might have more faith. You do better to read 20 verses of scripture. Absolutely. Now, I'm not saying don't worship God, of course I'm not. But it'll lead you into worship. When you see who you are in Jesus, it leads you to a place where you just want to Absolutely. love on him and you just want to worship him because you see what he's done for you. Right, let's draw this to a close. Faith is a gift. Faith is a gift. Verse 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works which God has beforehand ordained that we should walk in them. Yeah. You were once in darkness, now you're in life. Yeah, I'm going to say this again just in case there's people in here who don't know Jesus. I know Jesus like some of these guys know Jesus. If you don't know Jesus and you're more religious, oh, I'll just go to church this morning because it'll make me feel better, you need to know Jesus. Absolutely. You need to receive him. It's a doddle. All he wants from you is sincerity of heart to know that you want to receive him and you can have him now. And you can walk out of here and never be the same again. However, do not think that everything is going to change overnight. You have a job to do. And the job that you've got to do is to get into this word of God, listen to the preaching of the word of God by people that tell you the truth, not people that give you fairy stories, people that tell you the truth, and allow your soul to be built in God. And then you can flow in God's love and mercy and grace and blessings. Amen? Now, I just want to, um, perhaps the worship team could pop up now and just play something nice and quiet in the background. I just really believe, and I, I felt this from the, the moment 
will ask me uh, to speak today, um, is that I'll just want to pray for everybody. On not get you all up, obviously. It'll take about two hours.